a lot of things went right on Earth to have uh, yielded complex life, absolutely. The number of factors that have been postulated um, has grown. Currently, the typical number you would see is, in a typical list, would have something like 20. We find that we need to be at the right location in the galaxy, that we're inside the circumstellar habitable zone of a star, that we're in a planetary system with giant planets that can shield the inner planets from too many comet impacts, that we're orbiting the right kind of star that's not too cool or not too hot, that we're on a planet that has a moon that can stabilize the tilt of its axis, that we're on a planet that's a terrestrial planet, a planet that has a crust that's just thick enough that it can maintain plate tectonic activity, but it has enough heat in its interior that it's still circulating its liquid iron core so it can generate a magnetic field, that it has an atmosphere that has enough oxygen to allow for complex organisms to survive, that it has enough water and enough continents to allow for the diversity of life or an active biosphere that you need to support complex creatures such as ourselves. All these factors have to be met at one place and time in the galaxy if you're going to have a planet as habitable as the Earth, which you need for complex and even technological life. In an attempt to estimate the probability of attaining this combination of factors simultaneously, some researchers have developed equations assigning a conservative 1 in 10 value to each factor deemed necessary for advanced life. If every element has to be there at the same time, you have to multiply the probabilities. And that's what makes the probability at the end so small. You've got 10% of this and 10% of that, and these things rapidly multiply to exceedingly small numbers. The numbers on the order of 10 to minus 15, which is 1 1,000th one of 1 1 trillion. And it's a number like that that you have to compare to the 100 billion stars that are in the galaxy. 100 billion is a very large number, but a thousandth of a trillion is much, much smaller. On their face value, these probabilities are speaking. What they're telling us is this can't happen, or this is very unlikely to happen in the galaxy. And that's where the evidence is pushing us. There are many probabilistic resources in the galaxy, but on the other side of the coin are all these factors that you need. You have to get just right in order to have just one habitable planet like the Earth. And that leads me to conclude that yes, we're rare in the galaxy. Hey, Dad, Dr. Gary Parker's gonna talk to you about Uh, did you follow all that math there? <laughs> uh, I may have a little simpler way of looking at it. To get a, a planet like Earth with the kind of life that we have here would be like rolling a 13 on a pair of dice. How long would you have to roll a pair of dice until you got a 13? Billion years, trillion years, gazillion years, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> And zero. The only way you're going to find a planet like this, with a life like we have with you and I here today, is the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth. It's not a matter of a little probability. It's an absolute certainty that only God could make the planet we live on. And I really love to be able to share that with uh, people today, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, when I began my teaching career uh, a long time ago, <laughs> so I finished up uh, 30 years of uh, teaching at the college level, various uh, uh, courses in biology and geology, but I started teaching uh, in high school in the town where I grew up, Arcadia. How many of you know Arcadia? Land of antiques? Okay, another Arcadia antique. Okay. <laughs> And the sad news is, when I began my teaching career, I wasn't telling that story. I wasn't telling anything like I'm going to tell you today. I was telling my students it was millions of years of struggle and death, struggle and death for millions of years, and millions of years of struggle and death that brought uh, man and all the other creatures into being. And there was no God involved in this process. So I'm kind of in the unique position of having been nearly tarred and feathered and run out of town for teaching evolution. And now nearly being fired from countless jobs and banned from campus for teaching creation. So, by the way, neither one of them really feel all that good. 
But of course, when I was preaching millions of years of struggle and death for uh, struggle and death for millions of years, I was only following the lead of that uh, eminent uh, evolutionist Charles Darwin. And uh, at the closing paragraphs of his Origin of Species, Darwin put it this way, from the war of nature, famine and death, to production of higher animals directly follows that. The war of nature, famine and death. And you know, I think we really need to do a better job of teaching evolution. That if we really told people what evolution was all about, they'd be a lot less likely to believe it and so on. Well, Darwin kind of got that idea. As he sailed around the world as a young man, he uh, got flunked out of theology school, didn't do well in medical school. His father's trying to get him focused and get him started. And he had a real fascination for beetles and natural history, so he put him on a ship, sent him around the world for five years to collect specimens. On the famous Galapagos Islands, he landed there as the sea turtles were hatching out of the sand, you know, making a mad dash for the sea. Gulp, gulp, gulp. They'd get eaten up by predators. Maybe only three out of a hundred and ever get that first taste of salt water. Gulp, gulp, two out of those three would get eaten up by predators beneath the waves. And Darwin began to wonder, how could there be any kind of all-loving, all-powerful God that created things when the world is so cruel, so wasteful, and so inefficient? And he struggled with that idea for, for 20 years and finally concluded there was no God and replaced God with the very thing that had earlier repelled him, this war of nature, famine, and death. And so that's what I was telling my students. Uh, it was a continuous struggle for the survival. It gradually brought man and all the other creatures into being. Now, once in a while, I would get a Christian student, uh, you know, that would kind of challenge me. Well, you know, the Thai big news fanatic and all. <laughs> and they would say, well, you don't have to be that hard on Christians. You don't have to be that hard on the Bible. After all, you can believe in the Bible and evolution at the same time. Ever heard of that idea before? And it's very popular. Is it? Ah, oh, there's no fight. You no, know, the Bible tells us who did it. God did it. Uh, evolution tells us how He did it. Millions of years of struggle and death. He just put the two together, and it was really God who used millions of years of struggle and death. Well, even as an evolutionist, I didn't fall for that one. <laughs> and I would say to the students, "What? God used millions of years of struggle and death to, to create things? Who would want to pray to a God?" They use millions of years of struggle and death to finally, you know, get, get it right. Who would want to pray to a God that wiped out 99% of all the species they've ever created? Who would want to pray to a God that buried all his mistakes as, as fossils in the ground and hope nobody found out how bad he'd worked at it? Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, besides that, you know, we really, I, sometimes people have said, well, you can go back to teaching in public school. You'd have to teach evolution. I like to say, no problem at all. I can teach evolution. By the time I'm finished teaching, it'd be a miracle if anybody believed it, but I can teach it. <laughs> the problem at our schools today, by the way, is we don't teach evolution anymore. Did you realize that? You can't find a public school, probably in America, anywhere that teaches evolution. They don't teach it, they assume it. You know, when I was in school, it was a chapter brought up for discussion, and you can look at the evidence on both sides, or you could talk about what the evidence meant. Now it's underneath the current in all the chapters and so on. And it's not ever brought up for open discussion. It's just assumed to be true. In fact, what? Well, it's one of the ways that you know evolution is not really a scientific theory. Scientific theories don't need a fleet of lawyers to protect them. <laughs> okay, they're defended by the evidence. That's a normal way you would defend a scientific theory. But things have gotten kind of backwards. So I saw Roger's shirt last night when we were getting some stuff ready. <laughs> Big target with ACLU in the middle. <laughs> and it's kind of an interesting struggle going on out there. And so this is one thing. We need to understand what evolution is all about before we want to blame it on God. But then I would challenge the Christian students. Besides that, uh, don't you guys believe that, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, you know, to, uh, to conquer death and to raise us to new life? And so don't you realize that evolution is the total opposite of the whole gospel message? And so was it really struggle and death that brought man into being, or did man's sin bring struggle and death into a world that God had created all very good? I was actually harder on the Christians that tried to compromise with evolution than I was with those who believed what God's Word clearly said. Well, if that's the way I once was, what happened? What made me change? <laughs> Three things. Free, 
coffee, donuts. Hey. Okay. <laughs> so if I lived a little closer, you know where I'd be going to church? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that is really fantastic. I actually even had my wallet out with some money ready to pay for all, all that wonderful stuff down there. But the Krispy Kreme company heard there was a creations coming, so they didn't deliver to me. Oh, yeah, that's kind of neat between the two services. So you get fellowship between the people coming out of the first service, the ones coming into the second service. By the way, I noticed you all here on time. Like, I should have thought of that when I was teaching those 8 o'clock classes in college. If I had free coffee and donuts, there would have been a problem. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, that uh, free coffee and donuts lured me into a Bible study uh, led by a chemistry prof uh, where I was now I was teaching in college. And, of course, I didn't want to study the Bible, the free coffee and donuts. I thought I could put up, uh, you know, with an hour of Bible study. Besides, I thought, you know, I could point out all the errors and mistakes in the Bible and maybe get the discussion turned around to something more interesting like evolution. But that's what got me interested in reading the Bible was to criticize it more effectively. So I open it up, you know, begin at Genesis 1, and here's this marvelous account of Eden, a garden of delight, a perfect world. Our first parents, all of the animals, designed just to eat plants. No animals ripping each other to shreds, no death, no disease, no disaster. Our first parents created to live forever. And I say to the Bible teacher, obviously the Bible's wrong. You know, just uh, you know, turn on the evening news, pick up a newspaper, look out the window. Fires, floods, famines, plagues, AIDS, virus, uh, wars, rumors of wars, the place is a mess. It's what Darwin said, the war of nature everywhere you look. Obviously the Bible's wrong. What do the Bible teachers say? Read on. <laughs> well, you only have to read the third chapter of the first book to find out something happened to ruin God's perfect world. That was the sin of our first parents. Now, I think we kind of need to understand that. That even though now I'm a creationist, I can tell you we don't live in the world that God created. At least we don't live in the world as He created it. Something happened to ruin our world. Maybe you've been out, you know, on a Tuesday evening, maybe knocking on doors, you know, uh, uh, you know, witnessing for Christ, and somebody answers the door, and you say, smile, God loves you. I say, well, what do you mean God loves me? Now, I've got a cousin dying of the AIDS virus. I've got a friend killed by a drunk driver. Where's this God of love and power you're always talking about? What do you say? Have a nice day. <laughs> no, there are things that are really wrong with our world that need to be set right. And what do we do? When do people really get around to mentioning God? Where does the media bring God up? As soon as some horrible disaster happens. A lot of insurance contracts say are acts of God. <laughs> All kinds of natural disasters and so on. No, let's see. Sunrise, the opening of a rose, the trampling of that rose that gave us new life. Those are the works of God. All of those other stuff we see going on as a consequence of man's sin ruining what God had produced all very good. In fact, it got so bad we read in Scripture that God destroyed that first world with a flood to give it a fresh start with Noah and those with him on the ark. Well, as a new Christian... I thought how terrible, not, not a Christian yet, as someone reading the Bible for the first time, I thought how terrible. You know, God creates a perfect world, we make one little mistake. <coughs> See, that's the way I looked at sin and totally rejecting all of God's gifts of love. One little mistake, God wipes us out. What the Bible teachers say? Read on. <laughs> and so even though we turned away from God, right there, in the same Genesis 3 that tells us about the ruination of creation, is also the promise of restoration of new life in Christ. And so uh, uh, we look around at the world in which we live. Wow! There's all a promise of restoration and redemption that we can have in Christ. And as I thought about that, uh, the four C's we sometimes call of creation. God's perfect creation, ruined by man's sin, corruption, destroyed by the flood, catastrophe, is restored to new life in Jesus Christ. And I realized, wow, I can see there's quite a difference here. You know, here I've been teaching evolution. Millions of years of struggle and death until death wins. Do you realize that's the final outcome of evolution? It was one of these talk shows. <laughs> uh, the one time I listened to it was during class time, and they had a couple of famous evolutionists on the program. So I thought I'd let my students, you know, hear what they were saying for themselves. And the audience wanted to know, what is the future old? What is the future old? So they act, uh, asked an evolutionist fossil expert, and he said, well, he says, I hate to tell you this, but 
when we study fossils, it looks like every species eventually becomes extinct, and I think that's what's going to happen to man. And the audience broke out into applause. We were all going to become extinct. That's really something to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> and then they turned it over to an evolutionary astronomer. And he says, well, the only thing I'm certain of is next April on the cosmic calendar, uh, the sun's going to expand, all life on Earth will be incinerated, we'll all be burned to a crisp. The audience breaks out into applause. We, <laughs> if we aren't extinct already, you know, we'll get burned up, okay? <laughs> But we have a more lively hope in Christ. Now begin to think about that. Next slide. <laughs> that according to creation, struggle and death are from man's sin. They're conquered by Christ. Life wins. Amen. And so I begin to think about that. And I thought, well, you know, I can see why somebody would want to be a Christian. The Bible has a happy ending. Well, life wins. New life in Christ. The Bible has a happy ending just like all those other fairy tales. And that's the way I looked at it when I first understood the gospel message of new life in Jesus Christ. That's the way I looked at it. Yeah, I can see it's wonderful. It's got a happy ending. It'd be great to be a Christian. We had a guy in our museum over in Chicago. That, or Chicago? Why in the world? <laughs> I, that can't even be a Freudian slip. I never want to go to Chicago. <laughs> uh, Arcadia. Okay, Arcadia, Chicago. I can see how I can get those mixed up. <laughs> I've got to worry about that one. <laughs> uh, in our museum over in Arcadia, I've been debating a guy on the radio. You know, and he showed up at the museum, and he actually said, you know, he said, I can, I, I'd like to be a Christian. I can, even, even if it weren't true, you'd have a happier life if you were a Christian. You know, but I just can't believe it. Well, that was the way I was. I could sympathize with him. I could see this wonderful message of new life in Jesus Christ, but what? Evolution had convinced me there was no God. The Bible was false. There wasn't any God out there to keep all those wonderful promises about raising us to new life and so on. Next slide. And so that's uh, what we're talking about. Now, don't misunderstand me. But what we're talking about today is not a little side issue out here or over there. It's a salvation issue. I don't mean, now don't get me wrong, I don't mean you have to believe everything I do or you have to be a science student of creation in order to become a Christian. That's not it. What I mean is that belief in evolution, a widespread preaching, and that's what it is of evolution, is a stumbling block that keeps people from even considering the message of Christ. Some of you have had that experience. You explain to someone the, the fantastic new life they can have in Christ, and they say, in fact, no thanks, I'd rather die. Why? Why would you turn down a free gift, free to you, it costs Christ quite a bit, but it's free to you. Why would you turn down a free gift of new life to just believe in death? And for many people, the answer was what I gave. Evolution. There isn't any God out there. God didn't make man in his image according to evolution. What? Man made up the idea of God when he reached a certain stage of evolution. God is just a figment of the human imagination. Who wants to worship a figment of their own imagination? And so that was a stumbling block that kept me from coming to Christ. But remember, the Bible teacher wasn't just a good Bible teacher. He was also a chemistry professor. And so he challenged me to look again at the scientific evidence that I thought I knew so well. The battle began. <laughs> For three years, we argued creation evolution. For three years, I used all the evolutionary arguments I knew so well. For three years, I lost every scientific argument. <laughs> now, some people are a little slower than others, but... <laughs> I finally caught on. What we see in God's world really does agree with what we read in God's Word. Right. And finally, in the back seat of a car, going on the way to a men's fellowship meeting where I used to heckle and pester, you know, I realized that I was going to accept and look for answers from God's Word, and I became a Christian. Right. Oh, wow, i got to tell my students about this. <laughs> And so I began to share some of the evidence for creation from my uh, own area in biology. And I have to admit, one of my favorite examples are those birds that make their living banging their heads into trees. They're the ones we call woodpeckers. we got a nesting pair of these in our yard over there in Arcadia. And uh, these things are really awesome. When a woodpecker hits a tree, uh, the deceleration experience is a thousand times gravity. And when the astronauts take off into space, they only experience five to eight times gravity. Okay, and they're all squished in their seats and their faces are all stretched out. The woodpecker experiences a thousand times gravity. 
The nerve and muscle coordination has to be perfect. A slip to the left or right, and the shearing force would literally spin the cover off the brain. <laughs> when the woodpecker hits the tree, the eyelids blink shut. Some say that's to keep the eyeball or uh, keep the wood chips out of the eye. Some say it's to keep the eyeballs from popping out of the sockets. Both of those may be true. And so if you're going to, uh, you know, uh, throw your beak into a tree, you know, for a living, you better have a heavy-duty bill, heavy-duty skull, some shock-absorbing tissue between the two, all that nerve and muscle coordination. Well, if you believe in evolution, where did all that come from? Well, evolutionists always start with something simpler. So you start with a bird that, it's not a woodpecker yet, it's just an ordinary bird flying around, minding its own business, sots. <coughs> it gets hit with a cosmic ray. The first step in evolutionary progress is some sort of damage to a gene, something scientists call mutations. Mutations are real. They produced over 5,000 birth defects in human beings. They produce all kinds of disease and disease organisms. But evolutionists say if you wait long enough, instead of just bad mutations, there'll be a lucky one. There'll be a good mutation. So let's play along, bird flying along, minding its own business, socks, get hit by a cosmic ray, lays an egg, and a little baby bird is born with a heavy duty bill. Decides to try it out. Whack! Throws its head into the tree. Now the bill is okay, but squishes in the front of its face. <laughs> Massive cerebral <laughs> age. Now you know why evolution is so slow. It's all those little dead birds at the bottom of the tree. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, if I said that, an evolutionist might say, oh, you got it backwards, you got it backwards. The first lucky step was the heavy duty skull. That's what came first. Now let's try it again then. Bird flying long socks, cosmic ray, little baby birds born with a heavy-duty skull, decides to try it out, throws its head into the tree. This time the skull is okay, but crinkle, 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 the bill all folds up like a bird. <laughs> You're still nowhere unless both of those things happen at the same time. <laughs> it's to Darwin's credit that he uh, called uh, compound traits like this, quote, difficulties with the theory. Uh, next slide. By the way, since death entered the world, some of those woodpeckers are doing more than just drilling holes to store acorns. They're looking for beetles in the bark. In fact, a couple of woodpeckers saved a grapefruit tree of ours uh, from bark beetles. But the beetles hear all that pounding, so they just crawl further down their tunnel. So, you need something else. A long, sticky tongue. But if you get a long, sticky tongue just by chance, what are you going to do with it? Okay, here it is dangling out of your bill. You, know, you keep biting your tongue. That's kind of frustrating. You know, hop along the ground. You trip over your tongue. That's kind of irritating. Flying along over a low branch. And your tongue wraps around the tree. So this is a real problem. The answer for the woodpecker is to slip that tongue in a sheath that goes all the way around the skull and inserts into the nostril. Next time you see a woodpecker, you know, uh, drilling holes, grab your binoculars and look, and you can see the scalp twitch as that tongue goes in and out of the tongue sheath. But of course, there'd be no reason to have a tongue sheath, no way for it to win the struggle for survival, unless you had a long, sticky tongue. But you wouldn't survive a long, sticky tongue unless you already had the tongue sheath. So you have to have both of those at the same time. Well, Richard Lamont and Harvard once said was, and I say is, the chief evidence of a supreme designer. And so I begin to share some of the evidences of things like this uh, with my students in the college classes. See, I forgot to tell you one little detail. Those early years when I was teaching college biology, I was teaching at a Christian college. Running down the Bible, ridiculing the Christian faith, mocking, <laughs> you know, creation, all that kind of stuff. Never got into trouble until I became a Christian. <laughs> and then I get into trouble. <laughs> In fact, I got challenged to a debate by the Bible department at this particular Christian college. Well, there were three of them, uh, and they'd been telling their students that the Bible is a collection of old, uh, 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 you know, the Old Testament is a collection of Babylonian myths and fables, Yahweh, Jehovah is a tribal war god of the Hebrew nation. For no relationship at all to Jesus Christ, the God of love in the New Testament. So here they were in, the, in their Bible classes, running down the Bible. Here I was in science classes, originally doing the same thing, but now I'm talking creation. No, the Bible's the Word of God. You can believe everything from Genesis 1-1 clear through the end of Revelation. 
Uh, and that's what I've been sharing. Back up one, since I don't want to miss the commercials. <laughs> All those arguments I used to use for evolution and the evidence that points away from evolution, the rest of the story that we have to fight so hard to get into classes, is in this book, Creation Facts of Life. It's one of six books. My wife and I have the table as part of a special pack. So we do have a nice set of books back there if you're looking for graduation presents, things like that. Uh, they're for all ages in the pack, include some of those, where the details are in this book here. And so I was sharing these things, and uh, there were, and you go on the next slide now, <laughs> uh, with classes. And uh, the Bible department, there were three of them, just one of me. They didn't want me to have the underdog sympathy, so they said, you get some help. So I got the chemist who led the Bible study, and a new biologist they'd hired. They slipped up and hired a Christian. <laughs> and so here was the great debate, the Bible department defending evolution, and the science department defending creation. Wow. And so that was interesting enough, it even got a write up you know, in, the, in the Philadelphia Bulls at the time. Unfortunately, that's a worldwide phenomenon. And so working with the Institute for Creation Research with Answers in Genesis in America and Australia for the last 30 years, I've had a lot of creation evolution debates and so on. It used to be with scientists, but that kind of died down. There's hardly any scientific debates anymore because the evolutionists won't debate. They've turned the defense of evolution over to lawyers, judges, and, as Pastor Gary mentioned, to the clergy. And so that middle uh, Sunday in February was declared Evolution Sunday by the evolutionists and the pastors. I declared it Creation Sunday. Of right. <laughs> and it's interesting that that uh, middle, that's the nearest to Darwin's birthday, February 12, 1809, which is also the birthday of whom? Abraham Lincoln. An excellent choice for Creation Sunday. A man who grew up in a Christian home had trouble accepting it, became more and more Christian, and really a devoted Christian. What different spiritual destinies those two men had. What an excellent, I want to put that on the calendar, Creation Sunday, next wow. February. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll see what we can do there. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, the Lord really blessed during the debate and so on. And you might wonder, why would anybody want to compromise a message of millions of years of struggle and death evolution? with a message of new life in Jesus Christ? Well, this may be the answer. Exodus 20, verse 11, part of the fourth commandment, for in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea and all within the midst, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Here's an experiment you can try. Go into a big shopping mall, you know, tap somebody on the shoulder. They turn around and they say, Hi, I believe God created six days a few thousand years ago. Will they laugh at you? Yeah, it works just about every time. Once in a while, someone says, yeah, so, so do I. But a lot of times, you're just greeted with laughter. You know, in the first century, if you stood up for Jesus Christ and the authority of God's Word, what happened? He got crucified upside down, boiled in oil, burned at the stake, tossed to the lions. What happened to the Christian church? It grew and prospered and conquered the Roman Empire. Now, if you stand up for Jesus Christ and the authority of God's Word, what happens? You get laughed at. What do Christians do? They just melt. You know, when we think back on it, a lot of times we can remember time in our life when we'd rather be dead than be laughed at. It's a very effective technique. Why didn't God warn us about it? He did. 2 Peter 3, in the last days, what? Scoffers will come with carefully reasoned arguments? No. With mountains of evidence? No. They'll come with scoffing, laughter, ridicule. When it comes to the facts, you read farther on 2 Peter 3, they deliberately ignore the facts, or willingly ignorant of the facts, and so on. And so this seems to be a real problem. You know, a lot of people can accept the idea of some sort of creator out there, and so on, but is it really a six-day creation a few thousand years ago? Do we have to believe that? Is it Oh, you know, people are going to laugh at me. You know, people don't usually laugh if you say you believe in a God, you know, of some kind. But if you say, you know, God of a six-day creation, the, the God, you know, who created us at the, the dawn of time a few thousand years ago. Oh, that's just too much. Lots and lots of Christian churches have just said, well, we don't want to bring that up. That's too offensive. You know, that'll keep people from coming to church and stuff like that. We just don't want to talk about that. Well, uh, one time we, uh, uh, our kids, uh, I became a Christian just before our kids started school. And we sent them through Christian school. And 
uh, the chaplain of the Christian high school from which they graduated, and a friend of the family, went off to seminary. And we saw him at church one Sunday, came back to visit, and I see him across the parking lot, wave, and I go over. And I said, hi, Greg, how you, how's it going? You know, how's seminary? And he says, oh, he says, it's just great. He says, I still believe in creation. Hmm. <laughs> now you think of a young man who's just gone off to seminary. You know, that wouldn't be his first remark, but he still believes in creation. You might have assumed that. <laughs> but I knew which seminary he went, and I realized that was practically a miracle. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, he said, I still believe in creation. And I said, oh, really? He says, uh, uh, what, what do you mean? He said, oh, I, says, I believe in creation. But now I see there's so many ways to look at it. You know, a day could be a thousand years. A day could be a million years, a billion years. It's an indefinite period of time. It could be anything but a day. And I said, oh, thank you, Greg. I really appreciate that. Said, you know, I have all this background in biological medical sciences, and there's all that stuff in the Bible, you know, about, about your body rising from the dead, that there'll be a, a literal bodily resurrection. But now I see, you know, resurrection can mean something else. It just means if you do enough good deeds in your lifetime, loving memories will live on after you die. That's resurrection. And Greg, you know, gets kind of digging, no, that's not what I mean, that's not what I mean. And I say, well, if day doesn't mean day, why would resurrection mean resurrection? Which of those concepts is harder to understand? Which of those is easier or harder for us to do? And so what's really the issue is not really the time. Uh, there's not, no matter what you do with the time, evolution still doesn't work. God certainly doesn't need enough time. The issue is, can we take God at His word? Right. Can we build on the sure foundation of what God says? Now that means a lot, doesn't it? But guess what? When you take a look at the evidence in God's world, more and more, this has been a thrilling development over my 30 years in creation science. The evidence for a young earth recently created is just exploding onto the scene. <laughs> Some of you have been in caves. Now not Florida, it's too damp. <laughs> Well, you've been in caves in the Old West and so on. You see these stalactites and sometimes there's a guy and he shows you a little drop of water on the end of the stalactite. And says maybe, you know, in a million years that water drop will evaporate and add a few more molecules of lime and the stalactite will grow ever so much a uh, teeny bit of longer, you know. Guess what? If you're in a cave with a guide, you're in a dead cave. Otherwise, it'd be too dangerous. But in the early stages, stalactites form rapidly. We know it from direct observation. Now, probably not since 9-11, but it used to be in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, you could go down in the basement. And under those limestone steps, there were stalactites this long. Somebody planned ahead, didn't they? They built a memorial to Abraham Lincoln millions of years before he was born. Wow! <laughs> or they formed more rapidly than you think. I was sharing this in Australia one time. A fella comes up, I'm the owner of Olson's Caves. I thought he might have been mad at what I said about how rapidly caves are. He said, oh no, he says, you're exactly right. He says, every couple of years, I have to go through my cave and knock the new stalactites off the light cords. He said, would you come up and so when tourists go through, you can help me explain how what this tells about the Bible and not about evolution. And we had a chance to do exactly that. Well, over in Arcadia, we have got some kind of neat things on display that talk about rapid formation of fossils. Okay, one of these, it's one of our cuter specimens, is a petrified teddy bear. Okay, now usually teddy bears are soft and cuddly, but my wife and I have been to a, a, an area of Mother Shipton's Cave in central England near Knaresborough, and there's just a flow of water through a, a limey little uh, crevice in the rock, and what they do locally is just hang teddy bears and, you know, anything soft, you know, in this lime-rich water. And in three months, this soft, cuddly teddy bear has turned into a petrified teddy bear. And we'd be glad to show you that if you come over. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, uh, talk about petrified wood. I was on a talk show in Miami one time. A fellow calls in. He says, you know, I, I think the earth has to be millions of years old. I've been to the petrified forest in Arizona. Well, I've been there too. I take students there. He says, and here are these great big logs, and there really are logs bigger around than you can reach both your hands, over 100 feet long. I've had students pace them off, turn to solid rock. He said it must have taken millions of years to turn those great big logs into solid rock. Well, what did I say? Well, let's think about that for a minute. You know, if a tree fell over in a forest or a lake or a river, you know, just laid there for millions of years, you know, wouldn't the termites get at it? You know, the bugs and the fungi just decompose it. In fact, that's my basic Hurricane Charlie clean. I'm still cleaning up from Hurricane Charlie. <laughs> we 
think of, you know, five acres, five feet high of debris, twig debris. You know, we got a lot of it back from the house, and I'm worried about brush fires. But my basic approach now is termites, okay? <laughs> Finish it off for me. You know, the chainsaw's worn out. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, they just disappeared. But I said, imagine these big trees got, uh, you know, ripped up in a slurry of limey mud or volcanic ash, got buried quickly, the minerals crystallized in the pore spaces of the rock, hardened it up before it rotted, then it'd be preserved so we could see it today. What did he say? Huh, I believe you're right about that. That was kind of neat. First, it's a convert I'd ever made. <laughs> And so, in fact, there's a formula commercially for making petrified wood. You can make it in a week. Place your order on Monday, and it'll be shipped out Friday. Not Friday a million years later. Friday that week. Well, we also have on display at our museum in Arcadia a fossil clam. <coughs> well, you might think, big deal. You know, I got it in my driveway. You know, what's, what's the point of a fossil clam? Well, that's what I thought initially. We were hunting clams in a quarry, and my wife goes, Gary, Gary, come look what. But, hey, we got the same thing, but, I just know how to spell it right now. <laughs> and so at any rate, she Gary, Gary, look what I found, look what I found. And I come racing over there, and she's holding a clam in her hand. And I thought, you know, I came all the way across the shell pit. I said, well, you have a nice clam here. And I turned around to go back. Oh, no, look closer, look closer. I said, oh, they, oh, oh well, yeah, I, I see it's an elegantly, exquisitely beautiful polysopod. Oh, no, no, no. It's more than that. You know, so, so now I'm beginning to worry. Look, 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 look. And she and says, look, there's some meat on it. So, oh, you've got an elegantly, exquisitely, beautiful polysopod that stinks. Wow. You know, I have to turn around to leave. <laughs> she says, no, this is a Pliocene index clam. Now I'm beginning to catch on. And so to an evolutionist, an index fossil is an animal, remains of an animal that lived at a certain time in the past. And so this was a Pliocene fossil, should have been at least 2 million years old, maybe 5 million years old, still had some meat on it. Now I have to admit, I thought she'd misidentified the clam. It was just a modern clam that crawled in there and died a couple of weeks ago. But being a good supportive husband, you know, I took her and the clam up to the State Museum in Gainesville and to show it to the experts and so on. And as we got into the room, I had my battle plan in place. I snuck behind the door, you know, so I wouldn't be embarrassed. And she went over to show him this, and as soon as he told her that he, she misidentified the clam, I was going to walk over, wrap my arm around her shoulder, and whisper into her ear those three words every woman wants to hear. Let's eat out. Okay? <laughs> I had to pick the Sonny's Real Pit Barbecue. Okay? <laughs> well, <laughs> to my surprise, you know, she shows him the clam. And he says, yeah, you're right. This is a Pliocene index clam, Milphia calusiensis. You're right. It's still got some organic material, some meat on it. You're right. This thing should be two to five million years old. You're right. This is a real mystery. And he pulled out a drawer full of them. And there's all this evidence. In the first hour, I talked about the fresh meat, the bone marrow, blood vessels, and blood cells found in dinosaur bones. There's all this evidence out there that those fossils are not millions of years old at all, but only thousands of years old in Grand Canyon. So it was my privilege, I forget now when that was, uh, the Clark family, including Mitch and Elise, as well as uh, Gary and Joy, were with us on a Grand Canyon hike. And Gary and Mitch did a great job of singing that would be used to attract attention of other campers. Joy and Mitch are terrific hikers. I'll let Gary explain the other side of the story. <laughs> but at any rate, one play, the joy got far enough, one step, just like that, you can walk across 150 million years of supposed evolutionary time with no <coughs> evidence of anything happening. It just looks like one rock was laid down directly on top of the other. No evidence of erosion to erase 150 million years of rock. In evolutionist myth, that's a phenomenal problem. Radioactive decay dating. And so when I was a graduate student working on my doctoral degree, I took that firsthand to learn about these methods. And there's a lava flow at the bottom of Grand Canyon you see here. And evolutionists, you know, dated a little over a billion years old, and they were happy about that. But at the far end of the canyon, there's some lava that came out on the top of the canyon, the western end. There's about 1,400 volcanoes, a bunch of them went off in historical times. The Indians saw it. And they filled up the lower part of the canyon with lava, dammed up water all the way back into Montana and Wyoming. And then that dam finally broke, 
and left behind lava falls, the fastest navigable rapids in the world. And I've had the privilege of rafting over those uh, rapids there. Well, of course, this was on the top, but when they used the rubidium strontium method, it was older than the lava on the bottom. And so if you took radioactive decay dates literally, the canyon formed upside down. Maybe it's a Bible we should take literally, and radioactive decay dates with the grain of salt. Right. And, well, there's a team of scientists, uh, international team of scientists, that begin to look at radioactive decay dating uh, and to see what it really is telling us. It's not telling us the age of things. And wow, did they discover some interesting stuff. Helium. When uranium breaks down in the lead, it gives off helium into the atmosphere. If that had been going on for four and a half billion years, we'd all be talking in a high school year voice because we're all in the atmosphere. <laughs> but it's not there. Evolution has said, well, maybe it's still trapped underground and hasn't leaked out yet. So Russ Humphreys, an award-winning uh, physicist from Sandia National Laboratories, he examines the helium diffusion rate, and guess what? It's leaking out faster than the evolutionists thought. And based on helium diffusion rates, the age of the Earth would be, guess what? About 6,000 years. Next slide. My favorite, though, is carbon-14. There's only enough carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere for an Earth less than 20,000 years old, in fact, closer to 10. What's going on here? Uh, so uh, carbon-14 has a short half-life, just 5,730 years. So evolutionists never tried using carbon-14 on old fossils like dinosaurs and trilobites and coal. John Baumgartner, award-winning uh, scientist who's an expert in plate tectonics, examines coal from rocks that are thought to be 300 million years old, 100 million years old, 50 million years old. Guess what? He finds carbon-14 at four times the minimum detectable amount and the same amount in all those specimens, meaning those rocks could be no more than a few thousand years old at the very most, and they were all the same age. So it looks like all of those fossils were formed during the year of Noah's flood. Uh, an evolutionist recognized this problem a long time ago. And he said, creationists are right. Carbon-14 hasn't yet reached its equilibrium rate. The age of the atmosphere must be less than 20,000 years old. But here's an evolutionist writing a textbook for evolutionists at one of the most prestigious scientific universities in the world, believes in evolution, but he believes in being honest with the evidence. So he said, it's possible a greater concentration of water vapor existed when? Prior to the biblical flood. So here's one of the world's leading experts in this area saying we're either dealing with a young Earth or with a recent global flood. Okay, uh, next few slides. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and so uh, when it comes to radioactive decay dating, oh, let's see, I did one more statement about John Baumgartner. Not only did he find carbon-14 in, quote, old fossils, he found it in kimberlite diamonds deep in the mines of South Africa. And this rape project is summarized in the book, Thousands, Not Billions, that's on the table back here. And so far, evolutionists haven't even criticized it. They haven't even been able to find a misspelling or a miscalculation. They're just hoping nobody finds out about the book. We're hoping you tell them about it. <laughs> and this is just a fantastic new area. So it looks like a radiometric decay dating, like evolution itself, is a faith the facts have failed. Well, the Bible's based on faith too, but what? It's a faith that fits the facts. Uh, next week. Uh, and so, by the way, the one thing I want to emphasize, science is not, 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 not the enemy of the Christian faith. Science is the Christian's ally in its battle with evolution. Sometimes people say to me, well, you still can't take the Bible as a science textbook. I like to say, boy, oh boy, you're right about that. I've written five science textbooks They've all had to be rewritten. The Bible never had to be rewritten once. God got it right the first time. And that's the basis that we can build our life on. Not the ever-changing words of him, but the never-changing word of the living God. Let me turn it over to Gary again. You may never invite me again. That's I'm all right. You should enjoy the doctor.
Amen. Thank you for being here today. We do want to take a moment just to reflect on, on what he said. I'm not going to re-preach anything that he said. We believe the Bible. At Fellowship Church, we believe the Bible. We don't mind folks stopping in and kicking the tires to find out what we're talking about and what we believe in here. But if you kick the tires long enough here at Fellowship, you're going to know that we firmly believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in His Word. I believe it's true. These pastors, 10,000 of them, signed letters that they didn't believe the account of creation. I think it's just downright rude when God writes the Bible, the first words out of His mouth, and in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and you say, you know, you're a liar. I don't buy that. God gave us His Word. Now, if you want to reject His Word, that's your business. Go ahead. But playing games, that just ain't going to fly, friend. Not down south. It sure doesn't fly with my kind of thinking. If I'm going to believe Jesus Christ came, lived, died on the cross, rose from the dead. But now, I can't believe that at it, though, now. You know? I tell you what, friend. The Bible's true. Why did we do this? Why did we have last week on creation? Why did we have the doctor come in the house today? Because when I finished up my series on Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Remember? He tried it all. And he said, let me tell you what I found. After I tried it all and did it all, I'll tell you something. Remember your Creator. You're going to stand before Him one day. And all your little fancy theories are going to fly, friend. And that's why we did this seminar, this series, the last couple of weeks. I hope you've enjoyed it. hope it's been a help to you. We want to strengthen your faith here in this place. Amen?